Welcome to Create the Best Me. I am Carmen Hecox, a personal development coach, and I am so excited to be connecting with you today. Whether you're listening to the podcast or joining us on YouTube, my goal is to help women navigate through midlife challenges with compassion, inspiration, and empowering conversation. Each week, we'll dive into thought-provoking topics designed to build self-confidence, overcome invisible women syndrome, and find the courage to create the best version of yourself. I'll also be joined by expert guests who will share the wisdom and insights. So make yourself comfortable and let's embark on this journey together. Well, hello there, fearless midlife trailblazers. Welcome to Create the Best Me. If you are new here, I am so glad you made it here. If you are returning listener, welcome back to the one and only place where we encourage and empower women in midlife to pursue their dreams and live life to the fullest. I am Carmen Hecox, your host and personal development coach. And speaking of living life to the fullest, today's guest is a masterclass in that very thing. A woman of many talents, Heather Hawk penned the screenplays for the beloved movie like Freaky Friday and What to Expect When You're Expecting and has dazzled the theater world with her Tony-nominated and Oliver-winning creations, Legally Blonde the Musical. Now, between her days as a magazine editor and a laugh-out-loud member of an improv comedy trope, her unexpected but unforgettable role as a judge on MTV's The Search for the Next L. Woods, Heather's journey is nothing short of awe-inspiring. She has faced her set of challenges like her time at Caroline in the City and Delbert, but the universe had Big plans in store when she clenched the Walt Disney Screenwriting Fellowship back in 1999. Fast forward to today, and she's not just a screenwriter, but she's also an author of a youth adult novel, Freaky Monday. And diving into the world of adult fiction novel, she brings us the trouble with drowning. Joining us from her vibrant home in Manhattan Beach, Filled with their husband, two dogs, a golden doodle, and a quirky pug, please give a warm welcome to the incredible, the vivacious Heather Hawk. Heather Hawk, welcome to Create the Best Me. Oh, thank you for having me. It's so good to be here. Um, can you tell the viewers who you are? I am, first and foremost, uh, professionally a writer. I have been a screenwriter for about 20 years. I moved out to Los Angeles after an awful divorce and trying to reinvent myself and become a screenwriter, and it worked. I won the Walt Disney Screenwriting Fellowship in 1999, and I've been a writer ever since. I wrote Freaky Friday, What to Expect When You're Expecting, and because of that work, I got to become the book writer for Legally Blonde the Musical. So I worked as the librettist for... Legally Blonde the Musical. I've also written a YA novel with Mary Rogers called Freaky Monday, but I'm here to promote my debut adult novel. It's called The Trouble with Drowning. And let me first say congratulations on your upcoming book, The Trouble with Drowning. Without giving Thank away you. too much, can you give us a brief overview of the plot? Yes, it is a psychological thriller, so I don't want to uh, give out all the secrets but it's basically about a woman. She's had kind of a troubled life. She's been in the foster system and she's on scholarship at the University of Arizona for writing. And she starts dating her first love, who is also the son of one of her heroes, a professor. So it's sort of the life that she's always wanted. And when that relationship falls apart, she also falls apart. And when he starts dating someone new, it's the nightmare you do not want your ex to start dating. And so she wants to not only push her from her perch, but replace her completely. Oh, my goodness. That sounds so thrilling. I can't wait to read the book myself. Thank you. It's a it's fun. It's a slow burn, but it was super fun to write. How did your journey with screenwriting influence the pace and structure in The Trouble with Drowning? You know, I always say every medium is different. 
you have to kind of use different tools. But ultimately, your job as a writer is the same thing. You are telling a story. You are taking the reader or the viewer on a journey via a character who's going to go through some changes. And you just have to lean in to the gifts of every medium. And so visually, as a screenwriter, you are trying to write to create images and feelings in the reader's head. And that's essentially what you're doing as a writer as well. You're trying to allow the reader to see basically the movie that you're creating on the page. So it's just a lot of subtleties of, um, for example, I think in a screenplay, you tell more and in a book, you show more through subtleties of character. So I had to kind of, I'm still having to undo a lot of that training and a lot of that writing style. But ultimately, you want to tell a story that engages people and brings them in and have it relatable and have it move and keep the pacing alive. What aspects of the novel writing did you find most liberating as compared to screenwriting? Uh, It was just so wonderful to really go into the heads of the characters and to let them breathe and to luxuriate in the details of a novel. Um, You know, brevity is everything in a screenplay and moving a scene along and making it as tight as possible. But you get to breathe in a novel. And it's those little details as a writer. And that's what I'm interested in in life are those funny details that really make a person interesting or make a situation interesting that I'm trying to comment on. So it was just very liberating to have the luxury to indulge a bit more in the language. Mm -hmm. Were there any particular scenes or characters in The Trouble with Drowning that were inspired by your experience in Hollywood or Broadway? That's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily inspired by anyone I've ever met. Um, I definitely saw people like actors sometimes would float in and out of my mind as I would have fantasy file of Taylor Swift could play Eden. (laughs) Um, But no one in particular. It's all a creation of me and my imagination. (laughs) And that's a great one. How do you hope the trouble with drowning will resonate with both fans from your screenplay to your new readers. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a different, um, totally, it's kind of different for me. I mean, a psychological thriller is not something that I'm known for, but I love them. I'm a huge, you know, Hitchcock fan, and I absolutely adore reading psychological thrillers because they're just such a wonderful escape. They're so much fun. And I really hope that people will see there's commonalities in my characters in some of my humor, I think will come through and peculiarities that I always kind of observe. Um, But I think it will be a a big departure from what I'm normally known for, but I still have the hope that it has my signature fun. I think my pieces all have a sense of fun and of celebration and I want it to be really entertaining. I want it to be worth your time. Yeah. Well, you're known for funny. I mean, most of your work has been funny, entertaining, make people laugh. And this book's more of a thrill seeker. Yeah, and there's laughs within it for sure. Um, But yeah, it's darker. And comedy is what I love the most. I did improv comedy for years in Denver with comedy sports, um, an improv comedy troupe. And ever since I was a kid, like making people laugh is such a delight. It's, it's such a win-win. I just always, as a kid was like, okay, I feel good making you happy and you feel good laughing. This is a, this is a wonderful exchange. And, um, I just knew it was a way to kind of create a niche for myself as a child. So it's always something that I've been obsessed with Saturday Night Live since I was a young child and comedies. And I think it will always be in my work, no matter how dark it may get. (laughs) So tell me this personally, on the personal side, are you a funny person? Um, You know, 
funny is subjective. Like I can watch a scene in a movie that I think is the funniest thing in the world that someone else may not agree with me. And my, my daughter shows me things from TikTok or YouTube that I'm like, I don't understand why that's funny anymore. Um, you know, my friends who have a similar sense of humor that I do will tell you I'm hilarious, but probably not everyone thinks I'm funny. But, you know, it's just it's a value in my life. I mean, I don't if you can't laugh, I don't know what the point of being on this planet is like laughter gives context and heart connection. And I love crafting comedy. I love thinking about what makes things funny. I love it's endlessly, endlessly wonderful. Um, and I'll never stop. If I ever stop laughing, I've, I'm not here anymore. You've achieved great success in Hollywood and Broadway. What motivated you to venture into the world of novel writing? You know, I think COVID was like a huge midlife crisis for the world. And everything felt like it was falling apart. And it was very terrifying to live through that unknowing and destabilization. So I really went back to reading compulsively, which is what I did as a kid. I was always a huge, huge reader. And I got such joy from Little House on the Prairie and Nancy Drew. And then as a teenager, I had Stephen King and Judy Bloom And I just read all the time and it was my escape and movies and TV as well. But I've always been a huge reader. So when COVID happened, I was just looking for escape and and comfort. So I just started reading compulsively. And it was I've always been a huge, huge reader. I write down every single book I've ever read since like 1991. Um, but it became my therapy. It became a, a context of my day. Like my son and I at two o'clock would have what we called a read date on my bed and we would both read at two. And it, it reignited my love of books in such a kind of fanatical, obsessive way. And as I was going through COVID and really struggling to make structure and get through this strange time of having everybody in the house and the world falling apart, I was like, I'm going to write that idea I had 30 years ago. And I just started writing. I read a few books on writing, um, novels, because it's a different form. But I just intuitively, you know, I know how to write. And I was had such fun doing it. And it became everything to me and my escape valve for dealing with COVID. How do you think your background in screenwriting and theater shape your narrative voice in The Trouble with Drowning? I think I see what I wrote very visually. I'm definitely a fast-paced writer. I really want people turning the page in the same way that I want them turning the screenplay. Um, so I think that this would also make a really great limited series or movie. Um, so I think that it's really lent. My writing is very visual and very evocative. And I think that um, that sense of play and a, of scene is apparent on the page. And I was going to ask you that question. If you saw this book potentially being on stage as a screen, as a play or possible movie. Yeah, I think it would be a great movie or a limited series. Um, unfortunately, with the writers, I'm in the guild, the writers guild, my wonderful guild, and we're on strike and I don't see any end in sight. And I can't go out with anything because I would obviously love to be attached um, as one of the co producers and um, I'd love to help write it and we can't go out with it right now so it's kind of a bummer but I still think it would have a great life like as a Netflix series it's kind of an update of single white female you know fatal attraction gone girl it has a lot of elements that are kind of in the zeitgeist so perhaps maybe after in the future there's that potential Knock out wood, be lovely. Can fans of your screenplay expect an Easter egg or nod to your previous work within this book? Sort of. I did name, I love musicals. There's a lot of music. Actually, if you go to my website at um, Heather Hawk, there's a Spotify link for all the music that I've selected. 
um, that's in the book itself. Um, I sing all the time to myself. I just, I adore music and I don't know what I'd do without music or laughter. So I named a pug, one of the characters says a pug and I named it Don Lockwood, which is the name of Gene Kelly's character in Singing in the Rain, which is one of my all time favorite movies. And I always wanted to have a pug named Don Lockwood. Um, it's not the most popular choice in my house. So I got to have my dream through a character in my, in the book. So there's a little bit of a nod to musicals and that people will definitely identify with. Yeah. Well, you do have a pug personally, don't you? I do. I am a pug person. My, my grandparents had them. And apparently the third word I ever said was hectic, the name of the pug. I love them. They're hilarious. They're like having your own Muppet. I mean, they just have the strangest face. And they they do say that, that pugs are the court gestures of the toy breed. They just have a great sense of timing and comedy. And I'll always have a pug. Oh, they're cute. I think they're cute. God's little weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> Both Legally Blonde, The Musical, and Freaky Friday feature strong, multifaceted female characters how has mm -hmm. your experience writing these women influenced the protagonist in your novel? I'm just interested in women's stories, and I'm really interested in it, you know, kind of commenting on what we're going through right now. Um, it's very complicated to be a woman. I think that's why Barbie resonated so on a lot of different levels, but one of the reasons it resonated so incredibly with everybody is, or most people, is because it really gave voice to how complicated it is to be a woman in this world today. And there's just a lot of contradictory information about what we're valued for and what people want out of us and always kind of walking that tightrope of satisfying everybody. I mean, I think that just always trying to take care of everybody and always trying to make everybody comfortable is just such a female um, perspective. And I'm really interested in women's stories that are empowering and not maybe it, it may be in a more um, unconventional route. Like Elle Woods on paper would not be seen as the most traditional feminist heroine, someone following her ex-boyfriend to college. That's not the best choice, but her mistake ended up leading her to where she needed to go and to find her own strength. So I'm also for lo looking at the messiness that it is to be a woman. And Kat is not a uh, linear character. She is a mess. She has had a troubled past. She definitely m battles with mental illness and she's struggling, uh, but I have great sympathy for her. And I really wanted to give uh, a humanity to a messy character, to a complicated character. And I'm interested in exploring what it means to be a woman today. Yeah, and well, but I think you also did that with Freaky Friday when the mom and daughter just switched places and you gave the daughter a perception of what it's like to be a mom, how difficult it is, the um, expectations that society, that our family has on us. Yeah, I, yeah, and and how different the, all those expectations are and how much we think we understand what the other's going through when we have no idea. I mean, that was, what was so fun to come up with the test character for Jamie Lee Curtis's character in Freaky Friday was she was literally a psychologist who was helping people and thought she knew everything um, about what it was like, you know, to, how to help someone and, and what it was like to be a teenager. And she had no idea. And I actually wrote a, a, a storyline that didn't make it to the final um, film that I wrote that the character of Stacey Hinkhouse, which was the popular girl, which Don Hinkhouse was the, our most popular person in our middle school. Um, so I named her after <laughs> Hinkhouse. Um, but I had it in, the, in one of the original scripts that Tessa's character was actually helping Stacey Hinkhouse with problems. Huh? And so, you know, Anna got to see that the woman that she thought had it all perfectly in, uh, you know, in school didn't. And so I don't know what happened in the iteration of it didn't make it, but I thought that was a really interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People are not what you 
think, and everyone's going through something, everybody. Yeah. What was it like to work with Jamie Lee Curtis? Well, it's she's wonderful. Everything you could ever hope she would be, she is. And it was supposed to be Annette Benning, and Annette dropped out at the last second. So literally they called, I think, Jamie Lee on a Friday afternoon, and she was on set on Monday. Uh, and what else is really weird is that my mother looks so much like Jamie Lee Curtis and that to the point my mom has like a canned response to anyone who tells her she looks like Jamie Lee Curtis. She always says, oh, it's the body. <laughs> you know. So it's just weird that like the woman that uh, the mother character I wrote ended up being played by the actress that everyone said my mom looks like. Is your mom anything like the character on Freaky Friday? Um, not really. No, my mom isn't, she was a very happy to stay home and was a stay at home mom. And she loved that and very happily married and loved that role. Um, I always wanted to work and she was totally supportive of that. I always knew as a little girl, I'm like, I'm going to work. I always knew I wanted a family, but I, I wanted to have a job. Mm -hmm. How does the creative process in developing a story for the stage differ when you're envisioning it for the pages of a book, like a novel? Well, there's just a technical aspect of, I like, for example, when I first started writing Legally Blonde, I sort of forgot that, oh, right, you're not a screenwriter now. You can't just cut <laughs> the action and move it to another scene. You have to have this thing called the set that you have to be very conscious of and um, contain the movement. So you're ultimately, you're always seeing characters in your mind whether they're playing out in real life and you're trying to capture what a camera would see and or what a reader would see in that scene that the camera would capture. But then you would also try to write the action that happens on a stage. But you're ultimately moving a scene forward, moving characters forward. And how are you telling this story and going on this journey with these characters? And how is the story honoring the change that the character will go through mm -hmm. and the challenge that they will face? Yeah, because I think it's a little more complex because I always tell my daughter this whenever she's trying to write something. I said, you know, she's like, the teacher sent this back. It's not right. And I'm like, pretend like the person that you are writing for cannot see. So you have to mm -hmm. paint this entire picture for them. Right, right. You have to create a world. Yeah. And so yeah. how is that different from screenwriting? Because I think screenwriting, it's like there's already images there. Well, you have to be the camera. You have to set the, you know, exterior, interior. Where is this scene? And every, every writer is different. Like a lot of, there are some writers who really believe in total brevity, that they don't want to paint very much. And then there are a lot of writers, screenwriters, who are a little more detail-oriented and a little bit more precise and uh, give more, more depth to the setups, for example, and the scene. But you lay out everything as a screenwriter. And as a novelist, you lay out everything. As a Broadway book writer, you're working so collaboratively with the lyricist and the director and the composer that it is a, you know, you're always in working with other people so closely. And a novel is just all in your head. That's what, one thing that I loved about writing this novel too. It was, it was all my world. I didn't have to talk to any producers or have any notes or have anyone weigh in. I just got to do exactly what I wanted to do and create the world I wanted to create. So that freedom was just intoxicating and so much fun. Yeah. I would think that it was a little more easier because you're not seeking approval from anyone. The approval is you. Yeah. It's at once easier and harder because of course, collaborating with people is always, pleasing other people is always difficult, but it's also great to bounce off ideas. And when you're stuck, you know, you can help each other get unstuck. And I always say when you're stuck in writing, it generally is that you don't know what the characters want. And one thing to tell your, your your daughter for writing too, that's the biggest question I always ask myself, whether whatever form I'm with, what does the character want? What's the intention? What's the motivation? And that that's underneath every single scene. 
Great. Have you always loved writing? Yeah. Yes. I actually, I should grab it if I could find it. I, in like second grade, they gave a writing um, lesson and it was great because you got to write it. And then the secretaries typed it up and we got to illustrate it and they bound it. So it looked like a real book. And most of the kids, you know, we were like seven years old, did three or four pages. And mine was like 32 pages with chapters. In second grade? Mm-hmm. Yay. Leroy the Lion. And it's actually pretty good. I mean, you know, I, I was, it's not great, but the way that I, I, it was obvious that I was a huge reader because, you know, he said with feet, you know, it was, there was like, you could tell that I I was emulating what I was seeing. Um, and I've always been a storyteller. I mean, actually, I was a huge liar as a little girl. Um, and not in a great way. Like, it wasn't like, oh, I have a pony. It was, that's not my real father. <laughs> my best friend's mom thought that my dad was not my father for a year. When I was like five. Oh, my so, goodness. I've just always been a tall tale. And then I, I quickly learned that you can't tell lies. And it's it just gets you into a lot of trouble. I wasn't being... I was just bored with real life. I thought it was more interesting if, you know, I had a brother in jail. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So was it difficult? So now I get to change it in a very more productive way. My desire to live in another reality. <laughs> so I guess it was kind of difficult to decipher what was really your life and what was stuff that you were, it was your storytelling. Yeah, I, I just... This is the way my brain works. I just always, and it's a gift. I always tell people, you know, a lot of people come up and, oh, I want to be a writer. I want, I, I love to read. I love to write. And I always say, yeah, be a writer because one of the best gifts about being a writer is that every situation is potentially interesting. And you can go to a car wash and be stuck waiting for your car. You can go to the grocery store. And if you're watching the details and you're listening to people and you eavesdrop and you're curious about what how people are acting and motivated and the inherent funny that exists in just real life and just moments that you can see in a target. Like it's such a gift to be able to be that engaged and interested. I, I get information every day on dog walks, wow. you know, every detail is potential fodder for story. So do you have like a, a bank? So let's say you take your dog out for a walk and you see something and you say, oh, there's a story there. Do you do you jot that down? Or a weird neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Or I have a little notebook by my bed at night. Like last night, I couldn't sleep. And I was just thinking of this new idea I'm working on. Um, right. You know, getting up and writing down, writing everything down. And I love using that time of sleep too, because the conscious, unconscious mind, I think, is very creative. And I love dreams and I get a lot of information from dreams. And um, I, I work things out in that twilight of consciousness um, and in bed often. <laughs> I always get mine when I'm in the shower. I don't know what it is. Sound of the water. Wherever you get them, driving. It's usually, I love walking. I love taking my dogs on walks. And I love, there's something about that frees the mind when you're in activity when you have another part of your brain that's being kind of preoccupied, then it can allow sort of a, a creative flow. And that's why, like, when I'm, if I'm stuck and I sit down at a computer, it ain't gonna happen. Take a shower, go for a drive, uh, watch a great movie, whatever you have to do to just pull yourself out. So tell me, when you decided, I'm gonna write this book, did you know exactly mm -hmm. the book is going to be about this? I knew the basic character. I knew the basic conflict. I knew the sort of general storyline, but I really didn't have the ending completely figured out. I kept changing the ending um, over and over and over. And I knew I wanted kind of that big dramatic ending that a lot of these psychological thrillers, because I started obsessively reading a lot of them, um, that big, oh no, oh shit moment, you know? Um, I didn't see that coming <laughs> moment. So I knew where it was going, but it was really fun to let, 
I like to also let the characters lead me in different directions if they need to. Um, I can't really hear them talk unless I let them talk in my head on the page and not in, in an outline form. I don't hear them as well. I, I hear them when I'm actually in the work itself. And it's like having aliens invade your body because they talk to me and I have to spend time with them to get to know them and to hear them. And did you know all the characters that were going to be involved in your book? For the most part, yeah, for the most part. Um, but they took me on different journeys. Were there certain parts that you took out because they just didn't quite work out? I mean, the ending I kept fumbling with. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not going to tell any, you anything about it, no but spoilers. Uh, it just, it was hard to get right. It was hard to nail down and um, the timing, the the drama, it just, it was, t it was tricky. How long did it take you from start to finish to actually say, I'm done. This is amazing. This is the baby. Well, it wasn't necessarily amazing right out of the gate. I had to hire an editor and uh, there was a, there's a lot of work to do, but just to get it done. And I do believe that even if it's, if it, it's obviously going to be imperfect, but the way to write is to write and to get it done. And that demystifies a lot of it. And that's true with screenwriting as well. If you write one thing and you finish, you get to write the end. It gives you confidence to go forward and to know that you can do it. Because finishing something and actually completing a project is very difficult and seeing it through. Um, but then you have this big hunk of clay to really start molding. So it took me about, I want to say nine or 10 months of serious work. And then I, of course, hired an editor and worked more on that. You know, it, it was it was ongoing, um, but it was it was months of work what does your family think about it oh they're so supportive and my sister is a writer too she is a professor at the new school in new york city and her first book is coming out in 2025 but yeah my parents i dedicated my book to my parents because they've just always been so supportive of me i mean like when i they found out i was lying all the time <laughs> They, they just knew i had a big imagination they didn't give me grief about it and if i had been told as a little girl What's wrong with you? Why are you lying? They saw the good in that. They didn't try to, you know, tamp who I was. They always let me be this big creative person. I was always putting on shows and doing a little jig and, you know, moving furniture so I could have a stage. And uh, they just let me be me. And that's what I'm really trying to do with my children is whoever you are, it may not be who I am. It's not going to be who I am. Let you be you. That is a big challenge as a parent. It is. It is. The Trouble with Drowning is set to release on October 17th. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Can readers... Please, <laughs> read. I can't wait to hear what you say. Can readers anticipate a virtual or in-person event so they can learn more about the book or get their signed, get a signed copy? Absolutely. I'm going to be at Pages, my favorite bookstore here in Manhattan Beach where I live on October 18th at 6.30 and going to have a reading and a signing. And I'm also going to Zibby's in Santa Monica at 6 o'clock on the 9th. I'm going to Annabelle's uh, Book Club in Studio City. And it's actually owned by, this is crazy, small small world but amanda brown who wrote legally blonde the book that everything's based on is a dear friend of mine her daughter owns this bookstore and it is the first the world's first um ya bookstore but they sell lots of adult books as well and i'm going to be interviewed by janelle brown the new york times bestselling author at that one um, and that is on october 29th at 2 p.m which is a sunday at annabelle's bookstore and then i'm going to colorado where i'm from originally I'm going to go to Tatter Cover and Barnes and & Noble in Loveland and Fort Collins in early November. Busy, busy. I'll be at the Tatter Cover um, on Friday night, November 3rd. As you look ahead, do you see yourself continuing to write novels alongside screenwriting? Or do you envision adapting to one versus the other? I love the fluidity I've had as a writer. I love reinventing it 
I love that I've gotten to work in so many different genres and I could want to continue doing that. I do see as I get older, moving more a little bit toward novels. Um, I, who knows what's going to happen if they can get adapted and then I can do it. It's gotten incredibly difficult and com- it's obviously such a competitive field. Um, but really novels was an intentional pivot in my own life. I think I could be 70 years old writing novels. So, it, you know, for me, it's a pivot of intention, but I still want to continue doing, I would still love to do another Broadway show. I would love to adapt you know, work with a team to bring one of my books to life. I'm working on a new book that's much more of a comedy. I just want to keep writing. I just love engaging my mind with story and uh, I want to keep writing. Okay. Lastly, any piece of advice for any other screenwriters? or that are juggling the same thing as you, what piece of advice would you give them? A screenwriter in particular? Or, or... A screenwriter and somebody who's writing books. My big piece of advice, screenwriting is difficult because it's not just the screenwriting itself, it's also the business and it's also the competition and the, you know, they just don't make that many movies anymore. Um, and a lot of the kind of movies they make, Marvel movies, I'm never going to write ant-man three like it ain't gonna happen um so it's hard to stay positive i always say that a lot of writing is half of it i say the other half is staying sane in an insane business um so a lot of it is just trying to take care of myself and um take care of my mental health and stay positive and it's hard in, in a tough industry but at the end of the day Reading, reminding myself, seeing great movies, seeing great TV, it reminds myself of why I do what I do. Like, I love this. I am privileged to be a part of it, a small part of it, and I want to continue doing it as long as I can. And if I am inspired and invigorated and thrilled beyond words by and or sobbing hysterically at Barbie like I did, um, it makes me want to continue in this journey. Yeah. And continue doing what I do. And I would say I have it gives me hope. I have tons of respect for screenwriters, tons. Because I always oh, tell my husband, you. you know, you look at these big actors; it's the screenwriters that make the actors. Because without the screenwriters, there wouldn't be a story. I always say we're the only ones in this industry, this wild, crazy industry that employs so many different people. We need to get back to work. It starts with a blank page. It does. And a creative imagination. Well, we all have to channel our unusual minds in some way. And this is the way that society will allow me to be a little bit of a freakazoid. (laughs) It lets you live your ultra ego. I can talk to myself and not be a psychopath. I could just be a writer. Exactly. Heather, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming Thank on you. the this show. Yeah, this is so much fun. Yeah, and I really enjoyed this. I did too. I wish you all the success in the release of your book, The Trouble with Drowning. Everybody, you need to buy your copy. Pre-order it now. You can pre-order now. Pre-order anywhere books are sold or on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or your favorite bookstore. And um, I'm on Instagram at Heather Hawk Hearn and TikTok, Heather Hawk Writer. Um, and I would love to interact with anybody and love to know what you think. I really wrote this um, to help alleviate the stressful world and create an escape valve that is fun and frothy and has something to say. I will link all of your information in my show notes and Thank on you. my website and a link to where they can purchase your book again. All the success, and I can't wait to hear about your next book. Thank you, Carmen. All right. What a whirlwind of insights from the ever-talented Heather Hawk. We journey through the vibrant world of Broadway and Hollywood and explored the meticulous craft of novel writing. If you chuckled at Heather's previous comical writing, you're in for a treat with a twist. The Trouble with Drowning, her latest mystery suspense novel, is set to launch October 17th, brings a sprinkle of her signature humor, but ventures into a deeper, darker waters. 
For those seeking a read that promises a blend of wit and suspense, this tale is for you. You won't want to miss. Don't just take my word for it. Secure your copy by pre-ordering now. And once you've turned the last page, immersed in the suspenseful credos and the comical beats, share your thoughts with the community. We'd love to hear your take on this gripping narrative. Heather's information and links to order The Trouble with Drowning and today's transcript can be found at createthebestme.com forward slash EP032. If this episode resonated with you, please subscribe to stay updated. Join me next week as we'll delve into the topic of stress management, an episode I promise will be both enlightening and therapeutic, so be sure not to miss it. Until then, keep dreaming big, take care of yourself, and remember, you were beautiful, strong, and capable of creating the best version of yourself. Thank you for watching. Catch you next week. Bye for now.